I'm Heather Stewart. I'm the, the business editor of The Observer, um, but, but with a strong bias towards economics, I think it's fair to say. Um, we've got a great panel here today, and um, it's a fascinating moment to be discussing this issue, I think. We're five years pretty much into um, what is widely seen as, as an unprecedented financial and economic upheaval. Um, and at the same time, we've seen the emergence onto the global scene of a whole range of new economic powers, China, India, and so on, with, with different models, different values, different approaches. Um, and yet, uh, despite these sort of, sort of twin tectonic uh, changes happening at the same time, there are enormous vested in interests and there's huge inertia, um, uh, which means that the, the, the models and the values and, and, and the, the, the ideals that we've pursued for, for since the Second World War, really, in the West, are, are, are very sticky and very hard to change. Um, but, 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 you know, it's a great time to talk about these things because there's a great sort of ferment out there, and we've got a brilliant panel to discuss these issues today. So I hope you've got loads of questions in mind. Um, so the idea is that it's a kind of question time format, so, we, you know, we'd love to open it up and kind of keep it, keep it nice and lively and, and have lots of uh, interaction with you guys. So um, let's start by introducing uh, our excellent panel. Um, immediately to my left is John Lanchester, who is... Um, uh, a journalist and, and writer, uh, not least of restaurant reviews for The Guardian, but, but um, also a, a brilliant novelist who most recently has been trying to tackle some of the issues of, of, of the financial crisis and, and sort of economic um, upheaval and changes. Uh, and his, his most recent book is Capital, which, which follows um, the lives of a, um, a family uh, of all the families in a street in London, sort of through the, the, the recent years and, and what's been happening. It was, it was excellently serialised on Radio 4 recently. Um, and uh, next to him, to the left, is um, Jaiti Ghosh, who is, I think it's fair to say, one of the world's leading economists. I don't think that's without making her <laughs> too embarrassed. Um, but she's the Professor of Economics at Nero University in, in Delhi um, uh, and an expert on, on development and, and sort of macroeconomics more broadly. And to her left is Will Hutton, who will be no stranger to readers of The Observer, certainly. He's a, a long-time columnist for us, but also... Um, uh, writer, broadcaster, and, and more recently, principal of Hartford College, Oxford. Um, so, uh, I mean, I've got a few questions up my sleeve, but let's start by throwing it open. Who's, who's got a question in mind? There are mics, I think, that will come whizzing towards you, hopefully. Oh, don't be shy. There's, one, there's a guy in the middle at the back there. <laughs> oh. Gosh, that's a good strong start. Will, do, Will, do you want to do you want to take that one to start with? Well, um, I think that look, I mean, there's the uh, there's the um, uh, there's the technical answer, and there's the and there's um, my strongly held view on this. Um, we want your strongly uh, held view. Will. We're going to get the technical. I mean, technical <laughs> the technical answer is is that um, um, you've got to show they demonstrated they broke the law, and it's. Um, you know, I've asked this question quite a lot of um, FSA officials, and you know, it's not clear precisely what law um, was broken. Um, and secondly, I mean, I, uh, so to bring up, secondly, uh, the technical thing is, is that the, um, you know, the, the record in actually winning these cases uh, is extremely poor. So you've got to have bloody good evidence and be bloody certain that the, the man or woman you're going after, um, uh, you're going to actually succeed. Otherwise, it's going to be another embarrassment and, and X, Y, Z walks free. Um, having said that, I think it's you know, um, scarcely believable um, that we've gone through this crisis. Um, I mean, Britain is um, absolute leader of the pack. Um, we had the biggest banking sector in the world in relationship to our GDP. Um, Kind of more nefarious practice went on in London, as much nefarious practice went on in London as it did in New York, certainly, and probably more, you can't be sure. And, you know, we've had no attempt, zero attempt, to have a, uh, uh, the equivalent of what South Africa did um, after apartheid, you know, a truth and reconciliation exercise, at the very minimum, thank you, Ryan, would be, would be good. Um, we had one investigation 
launched by Alistair Darling, who I know is generally regarded as a, uh, you know, kind of the sainted Alistair, um, and uh, I've got a lot of time for Alistair, but actually it needs to be said that the investigation that he launched in the wake of the financial crisis um, ended up with uh, uh, recommendations that actually there should be as little additional regulate, we shouldn't lose our, our heads, and there should be as little regulation and extra taxation as possible. That was the Labour government in 2009. You know, so you know, I think we need two things. And I'll let other speakers, I'm speaking to too long. One, I think we need um, a thoroughgoing um, uh, uh, process. I, I call it truth and I, I call it a reconciliation commission, or truth and reconciliation commission, which finds out what happened, why it happened, and who's to blame, and actually proper apology and, uh, and recantation. And secondly, that process should be um, public. And there are some people in some of the banks who actually um, uh, got pretty close to committing felonies. And actually, I think we should try them. And I think they, uh, and um, uh, even um, probably actually to kind of just ventilate, you know, everybody's sense um, that this is a fence uh, that has not so far um, produced. Um, uh, any convictions, and we need as a national community to go through that process. These people should be in the dock. That's my view. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I just add to that a little bit in terms of situating this in, if you like, the broader historical context? It's very unusual, this latest crisis, because if you look at the history of capitalism, almost every financial crisis is followed by this period of attrition, this period where at least a few bankers, at least a few of those who've engaged in malfeasance are imprisoned, are put through public trial. The latest example was 2001, when you had Enron and all of those others pretty much put in the dock. This is unusual, and I think it's a comment across the world, not just in the, in the UK, but everywhere. It's a comment on how deeply entrenched financial lobbies are now in the elite, in the establishment in general. And therefore, the politics of changing it is that much more difficult. It's not the straightforward thing that, you know, well, this seems to be right. And I think it needs a much more generalized and much more explicit mobilization to do it now, because there is a certain degree to which finance has not politically been at all affected by this crisis, which is remarkable, but it's the, it's the case. I, I, I completely agree with, with um, Will and Jati. I think the short and shocking answer is because every, there haven't been any trials because everything was legal. And, and that's because the rules changed to make everything legal. And, the, um, and that's because we've been traveling in this, this direction for for decades, probably for three decades. And um, the analogy, I think the stinging historical analogy is with um, the savings and loan co collapse in America. Was it the late, late early, early mi mid-80s? 1,100 people went to jail. Mm. 1,100 executives. So that's it. The savings and loan are basically the American mortgage institutions. Not one single charge this time. That's the difference. And that's not because the nature of the actions were that different. It's because the rules have changed, and the rules have changed to basically decriminalise everything. And, and we do need to have a proper investigation into this and to what the rules need to be. Can you wait? Would you mind waiting for a mic? Please, please do reply. Whistleblowing site, and I'm in a sort of group of banking whistleblowers. And, for example, the PPI scam was the illegal. Insurance, the insurance that, that a lot of banks the were The payment protection insurance scam yeah. was illegal and it was criminal. The problem is we have a regulatory system in this country which still is light touch and mm. the, this government, particular government, receives more than 50% of its funding from the City of London. So nothing has changed. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. There is no political will to follow these directors who broke the law. It's not civil law, it's criminal law. And if you look into the Financial Services and Markets Act, you will find the code. There is no political will to chase down these bankers. The Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States 
have prosecuted over 200 people in Wall Street and gathered over $1 billion in fines, you get the FSA in this country has done diddly squat. <laughs> There's a hand at the, somewhere here at the front. Yep, so a mic winging its way. Lovely. <laughs> To worry about the future of capitalism because we probably don't have capitalism. In 2007, 7, 8, uh, capitalism would have said the market decides, but the market wasn't allowed to decide. You know, RBS would have just gone to the wall. There would have been an awful lot of pain and discomfort without a doubt. But other banks maybe would have then picked up the market that had more prudent lending. So, you know, do we need to even worry about the future of capitalism? Because we have, in effect, a, a state-controlled capitalism, and that's likely to happen, but it's the ruling elite, as we're, as we're hearing, just looking out for themselves. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Jati, do you want to, do you want to start well, you know, with that Yes. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. You know, that pure free market never existed. We are kidding ourselves if we think that in the past, capital didn't need the state. It, didn't, it couldn't exist without the state. It's not just in terms of you know, ensuring private property and all of that. It's because capital throughout its history has strongly relied on the state to create the enabling conditions, to create all kinds of other conditions for its existence. And it's always been hypocritical in that sense. It's not new that uh, you know, when it comes to the crunch, you, you move in and you bail out some financial interests and you do not bail out the people and so on and so forth. In the United States, it's the small mortgages who are all collapsing and the big banks are still laughing their, all their way in the bank. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's not new. However, I think what is new is that, in a sense, this is a system that is really running out of solutions. If you look at the last 30 years, every boom has been the product of a kind of created bubble. And we're running out, at least in late mature capitalism, you're running out of the potential for bubble creations. And that, I think, is why, yes, you do have to worry about the future of this kind of capitalism, because that route is no longer available, if you see what I mean. I mean, I could go on, but I'm sure my <laughs> panelists have. John, yeah. Well, I think, you know, I, I remember the, the sort of the bank, the, the bailing out and all that led to this thing that, I remember a great phrase of the socialist workers, a beloved thing, was state capitalism. That was an important part of what they saw happening in the, in the Soviet Union. They said it, they wa it wasn't um, a communist state, it was state capitalism. And the, the, a couple of weeks ago, that was actually on the cover of The Economist <laughs> to describe the state of the world's developed economy, state capitalism. And we have moved towards this thing that, you know, um, it's a monstrous hybrid. There's no way of describing it. You know, nobody's in favor of this system. Um, and there's no sort of theoretical model for it to be all right. And it's not capitalism. And it's manifestly not anything resembling social democracy. It's, it is actually this thing, it's socialism for the rich, but socialism for the rich was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> That's supposed to be, you know, an incredibly stinging, hilarious, laugh-aloud, funny idea that it's socialism for the rich, but it's actually the system. And I think that the sense that this, you know, as Jati says, this, this model has just conked out uh, in its current form. You can't really defend it or, or prop it up. You just have to say, you know, it's not meant to be like this, and we have to start you know, trying to figure out what the, what the next thing is, and indeed if there is the potential for change with the rules as they're currently constituted. Look, I mean, I, just building on that, I mean, I, I was talking to a leading banker recently, and um, he was reflecting on investment banking, and he was saying um, that in his view, having looked at it closely over the years, that actually he'd come to the conclusion that the business model of investment banking was built entirely um, to create um, enormous personal wealth for those who worked in investment banking, that there was no other point in investment banking but that. And that's, and that's from one of Britain's top bankers. And the thing is, is that this system that created enormous dynastic fortunes for themselves, because it was investment banking that actually was driving the crisis. It was the, you know, it was the, it was the extraordinary um, kind of der der derivatives that they created and, and, de and debt instruments that they manufactured that actually you know, was the shadow banking system that was the proximate cause of the crisis. Um, <laughs> and having made enormous personal fortunes, um, when the whole thing goes pear-shaped, so the losses were socialized. I mean, it is unbelievable. Um, and what my kind of take on this is that you know, we, it was bad capitalism that actually generated this crisis. I mean, it was, we were you know, actually, and to pick up your point, you know, no form of capitalism works 
um, because it's a, there's endemic risk in, in capitalism. You don't know the future. You, any single entrepreneur or innovator or investor cannot take that risk him or herself. They have to find ways of laying off the risk if we want investment and innovation to go forward. That means you either do it through the finan you either do that through the financial system or you do it through the state or you do it through both. That is actually, you know, that's been true since whenever. So, you know, any form of inverted commas good capitalism necessarily has a role for public agency and you know, to call it state capitalism is to kind of imagine that there's a form of capitalism which couldn't have the state involved, which is crap. Consequently, you know, where we the debate now is not, you know, well, we've learnt the lesson that actually you need the state in capitalism, so that not, not a problem. I think the debate, the debate now is a much more subtle and important one. It's that we know absolutely that the proposition of the free market fundamentalists was 100% wrong, that that's not how you do capitalism. Uh, I don't think that one can socialise the means of production as a solution to how you run an economy and society. So a much more kind of subtle argument is opening up, which is how do you do capitalism well? Um, and necessarily it has to have checks and balances in it, necessarily it has to have the state in it, necessarily rewards have to, be, have to be proportional, and necessarily we have to hold to account people who make dynastic fortunes, socialised losses, and then say that the best form of capitalism is one which allows them to do just that in the name of the free market ideology. Nonsense. Never true. And actually we can't let them get away with it. So it's much more important, I think, we're a moment in time we're in, um, than just saying we bailed out the banks and let's get on with it. Huge, huge arguments are opening up. Uh, chap at the front here, yeah. Tony, Tony, Judd. Tony Judd has said that liberal democracy has been undermined by a climate of fear created largely by the money men. Do you, does the panel believe that in fact uh, we are now being manipulated uh, and fears played upon to, uh, to keep, to prop up their rotten system. Uh, absolutely, yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, it, <laughs> sorry, I, but uh, it's, yes, there's no question about it. And what's very remarkable is Europe, when you look at it from the outside, how everybody buys into this ridiculous notion of austerity, and otherwise the financial markets will fix you. Mm. And uh, it's self-reinforcing and it's entirely based on fear. And it's extraordinary to find that it has spread like a virus across this particular continent in particular. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and to go back to the first question about why we, we've allowed it, I mean, it really touched on that the, 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 the political class are more frightened of the banks than they are of the electorate. Mm. And that, we, that, I think, we could change. Um, you know, that they, they feel they're blackmailed and they feel complicit and they share the worldview of the financial institutions. It's a sort of complicated set of overlapping things, which means that you know, but, but they make mood music towards us, the electorate, a lot of which turns out actually to be the opposite. I mean, I, one of the, my rules of thumb now in this field, so I'm not a cynic in general, but in relation to the banks and the economy, they do the opposite of what they say. We're cracking down on means we're doing nothing about. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very precisely the opposite. And, um, you know, the kind of... The when you look at the bullying language directed to the country, like, for instance, Iceland, I mean, Iceland defaulted for the... You know, they couldn't. But they simply couldn't pay their bets. Will is right that we have the biggest banking sector let now, but Iceland had the biggest then, 12 times its GDP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They simply couldn't repay their debts, so they just ripped them up, walked away from the markets. And guess what? They've just had their, their debt restated to investment grade from junk grade because they're paying it back now. You know, it was the worst thing in the world, the most apocalyptic nightmare, doomed scenario, and, uh, and three years later, it's all fine again. So I think there is a sort of systematic attempt to bully and intimidate and to make sure that the people in power, as I say again, that they're more frightened of the financial sector than they are of us. Will, do you agree? I mean, I, um, of course, I mean, of course, except, I, would just, I think, I, I just caveat it to, to a degree. I think that um, it's, you know, there are, <laughs> I know it sounds absurd, but, you know, there are bankers um, who um, absolutely would agree with this conversation so far. Mm. You know, it's not as if, you know, 
every banker is um, is uh, you know feathering their nest, um, kind of regard calling their clients muppets, um, and uh, you know devil take the hindmost as they kind of head for a Palladian mansion in Gloucestershire or outside New Delhi, um, uh, in order you know to kind of to kind of live well on on ill-gotten gains, you know, I mean I think there is a um, and it, you know, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, what Tony Jupp was saying, I think, was um, that we, and, and I, and here I do agree with him, that actually, you know, world finance has got. I mean, I don't people. I mean, you know, world finance is kind of completely run amok um, to a degree which I don't think anyone, you know, understands. I guess give you a couple of figures which I think are quite important. I mean, world GDP is seventy trillion dollars. Yeah. Big number, um, and uh, you know Britain's about two and a half trillion, about seventy, so you know we're tiny really. Um, and uh, you know world private debt is about one hundred and fifty trillion dollars. That's a really big number. Then you've got public debt on top, and seventy trillion dollars. But world financial transactions run at six or seven hundred trillion dollars. Now you know the world has never been in a, in a in a place like this. I mean, it is you know absolutely extraordinary. That you have, you know, world finance is actually the tail wagging the dog of the world economy. And yes, it's in that sense that actually they hold the real economy worldwide in thrall. Um, and I, I really don't know how this um, play is going to work out. I mean, we're in Act One of a five act play. There's a genuine um, reason for politicians to be nervous, isn't there? I mean, uh, that's, some of this fear is absolutely genuine. Is, we, is how? You know, we what, don't know. We, we don't know. We don't know whether there's going to be you know, the value of those claims, the value of those private debt claims, on the world economy cannot be met. Cannot be met without you know collective austerity lasting for a decade or more. So what's going to happen? Are we going to have multiple defaults like Greece has had? The next country up might be Spain. I don't know. Um, are we? Are we? Are we actually going to have um, collective austerity, which would lead to I think. Um, uh, protection, the breakdown of the world trade system, and that in the past has always been associated with war. I don't know. Um, or are we going to have inflation? Is there going to be inflation which actually will make the real value of these debts lower? And actually, I, uh, you know, we, no one knows at, at the end of an Act One of this five act play what's going to happen in Acts Two, Three, and Four. You know, um, and I, uh, my own money. Um, my own bet is that the way through this is going to be inflation and actually with the and growing anger um, amongst civil societies worldwide and actually the re-regulation of finance. That's where I think it's going to go. But it's going to be a choppy, volatile and unpredictable ride. Uh, guy in the, the middle with the hat on there. Uh, howdy down there. Um, oh, I, okay. I'm We're going up there. I can't see you. Where are you? Oh, I'm over here. Oh, okay. Oh, oh the sad. Oh, right. Oh, right. oh got you. <laughs> Hi. Howdy. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you're aware of the Occupy Wall Street movements and obviously the Occupy London Stock Exchange. Uh, I, I'm just wondering um, how much of a, um, a threat to the status quo that those groups represent, um, how much they've shaken the system, um, and also uh, how complicit do you think that governments are and state institutions are in cracking down on these protesters? It recently was revealed that the NSA and the FBI were keeping uh, track of Occupy Wall Street, for example, uh, and giving tips to local law enforcement agencies on how to crack down and, and keep track of these people, essentially. So, so what sort of threat to the system do they represent, if any? Uh, and, and what do you think about uh, the role that governments are playing in, in uh, keeping these movements either suppressed um, or, or allowing them to proceed? Thank you. Right. Has there much, been much occupying going on in Delhi yet? Uh, you know, there is, there's so much protest of different kinds going on in India that it doesn't take quite the same form as the Occupy movements. But the Occupy movements have huge resonance, let's say, among students in India. So it's, it's a very wide, symbolic kind of thing. You know, to me, it seems that all of these Occupy movements are the beginnings of the rumble. It's, it's just very, very incipient. You know, that most of them are reacting still emotionally, it hasn't really worked out theoretically, but it's asking, it's beginning to ask the right questions and, and it's the beginnings of what could be, potentially, I think, a much more widespread movement. 
But it's, as Will said, it's one of those things that's going to take time. It's not some, one of those things where, you know, okay, tomorrow there's going to be this big thing and governments are going to say, okay, we give up and yes, you're, you're right and so on. But, and one of the reasons that governments are joining to help crack down everywhere and in all kinds of protests. In India, it's to anyone who protests against the occupation of land, Ill illegal and otherwise, lots of other ways. Is, is also, strangely, because of this climate of fear. You know, I think it's a very strange phase of capitalism. It's very brittle. Everybody's nervous. I was in a meeting of, uh, you know, the, the leaders, of the, the rulers of the universe, these big bankers, all the major banks were represented in Vienna, Austria in December. They were terrified. They are scared shitless, excuse my language. They really don't know what's going to happen, actually. And they know the numbers that we quoted, they know only too well. They also know that there's tremendous public protest and that this is going to come up and bite them reasonably soon. They know that they have used up all the goodwill that they had in society and they're terribly worried about how to fix it. So there's this wide nervousness in the system. This is a very... Um, it's a phase of tremendous political flux, I believe, and a kind of churning. And in, in all churnings, in, in Hindu philosophy, we have this famous churning of the oceans where good things come out and really ghastly things come out too. And finally, you don't know what will emerge. Yeah. Will, did you go down and see the uh, protesters down there? Um, no, I didn't, although, I mean, I, I, actually, they invited me a few times and I kept, you know, I was in Oxford and they were in London. It was all kind of, but I, and I, and I you know, and I have said I'll do um, whatever they want me to do. So, you know, I, I, um, what I think about the Occupy movement was that it's actually um, uh, really, really, really important. Um, I think it's crystallised, um, it's helped to crystallise public opinion in both um, Britain and America and um, I think um, France and Germany, less so in Japan, and I'm not certain about India for the reasons that you've said. Um, and, what, and not only has it done that, <coughs> it's actually made um, people to start, especially economists, think really hard about the nature of capitalism and, importantly, about the nature of inequality. Um, I think it's changed the terms of the debate in the States. I think it was likely that Obama would have lost um, the presidential election in November of this year. I now think he's just more likely to win it than lose it. And I think one of the reasons that's happening is twofold. One, the American economy is creating some jobs. Two, there is a mood swing in the States actually against um, more plutocratic tax cuts for the rich championed by Mitt Romney or lookalike. Mm -hmm. and, and Occupy has helped to crystallize that opinion. But here's the second point. There is <coughs> some really interesting work going on. <coughs> There's a working paper published by a couple of IMF economists, and you go on their website and look at it, <coughs> are looking at the dysfunctionality of inequality the dysfunctionality of inequality. And what, what they've been looking at is how the more unequal a society you get is, tends to always prefigure a financial crash. Why? Because what happens is, is, you, is you get um, the mass of people borrow to sustain their living standards mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, they take on too much debt in relation to their capacity to repay it. And the financial system turns out the money with wild optimism and you get the asset price bubble and the subsequent collapse. Inequality, they argue, is economically dysfunctional. It's also dysfunctional for many other reasons. But that, those arguments opening up um, would have been completely impossible um, before the crash and I think Occupy a movement has helped crystallise them. Uh, it does, nor does it surprise me um, that law enforcement agencies are keeping a close eye um, that's what they do. Um, you know, it's what J. Edgar Hoover did. Um, I watched the movie on a plane recently. Um, <laughs> it's not very good, but it does tell you a lot about, uh, about the 1930s and uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that the FBI is doing exactly the same thing in America today. John, this idea of the 1% is a really quite a powerful one, isn't it? I think. I mean, uh, they um, Occupy London asked me to give evidence in their... Um, case fighting against eviction, which mm. at the High Court. Um, and um, I, I think that the power of their message, which actually, in fact, curiously, is more apparent at a slight distance, because they say quite a few things at the same time Occupy. I'm not sure they always fully understand the power and potency of the central thing about the 1% and the 99%. Mm. I think that compresses a lot of very important trends that are happening in the world, and the points about inequality we've been just discussing. And 
I think that the, you know, it, and one of the things it does is it proves what we've been told isn't true, that if you have these policies that liberalise and that suit the very rich, mm. that will all magically do better. Mm. And that's been proven false. Because what's happened instead is we've had this split with a tiny minority of super elite doing fantastically, astonishingly much better. I mean, the figure in America is um, all the income rise, I think, since 1980, more than half of it's gone to the top 1%. Mm. Now, the whole point was that that was not supposed to be like that. Mm. And I think Occupy have an, an, a very, very effective job at, at pointing that thing of, you know, not just pockets of inequality, but a fundamental inequality hardwired into the entire system. Um, I think it's not surprising that you know, states are worried about it because, as Jati said, people are, there's a, a tremendous amount of anxiety inside the financial system about exactly this point. And I saw that thing that came out of Davos, the number one threat to, the, to economic order, and they perceive it, is, um, is income inequality. You know, and they're, of course, they're seeing it, from, in a sense, from the other side of the question because uh, you could argue that quite a lot of them are in favour of income inequality. But... Um, you know, income inequality is an issue that is absolutely central to the next decade or two of, of, mm. of our whole planet mm. and Occupy directly put their finger on that. <coughs> uh, I sort of, can I, second row from back or, or is the microphone making its way around sort of autonomously? Uh, is somebody, oh, you've got, oh, well, excellent, hi. That's all right, I'm still here. Um, Good. In this country, we're trying to find, I guess, looking to other countries for, to learn their models of capitalism. So, oh, you know, we really must be more like Germany now or we've got to be a lot more like Denmark and all the rest of it. I, I think to a certain extent, some would argue that the future of capitalism lies in countries like India. Um, where's India looking? Um, I hope to God it's not at us. Um, you know, is it saying we really must be more like Bhutan? Or, or, you know, where's India looking for its model of capitalism, where it wants to go in the future? That's an interesting one. Oh, Josh, you dear. Want to you know, the bad news, it's looking at China. Uh, why? <laughs> because, by the way, that model also is coming up against a wall, the Chinese model. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. why is India looking at China? Because of the perception that you can basically have very high investment rates. So you throw a lot of capital at your existing labor and you get high growth. And then with that high growth, you lift everybody up. Okay, the, the rich a lot more, but, you know, the bottom a little. Certainly, China over the last 30 years has had a dramatic reduction in poverty. Okay, so that part, yes. Uh, the problem is that this, the Chinese model was based on two things. One, which you're all familiar with, you know, the, the fact that you can utilize your cheap labor to export to the rest of the world and generate more and more employment at a lower and lower rate. In fact, they were not generating much employment in the last decade, particularly. But the other is that, let's face it, India, China, and a lot of these countries are the last great hinterland of capitalism. There are many markets places that there are many economic spaces that are not yet commercialized, marketized, privatized. We still have public utilities. We still have, you know, huge potential for private investment to go in there, shove out the public guy and the public provision and make profit out of it. So that's dynamism. I mean, that's what capitalism <laughs> does, right? So in a sense, uh, the Indian model is based on this, on the fact that you keep luring the private investors to come and raise your rate of investment, throw some money at the workforce, and hope that that lifts everybody. The problem in India is that that hasn't worked for us. It hasn't generated employment. Unlike China, which was able to generate more employment because it was the first country moving in there, and therefore could actually expand its manufacturing, our growth has not generated employment. Our latest data tell us we've had the lowest rate of employment growth since the 1950s, for heaven's sake, with 10% GDP growth. So that's not working. Inequalities are rising just as rapidly and more offensively because we have much more widespread and open des destitution. We have the largest hungry population in the world, disgustingly high rates of infant mortality, maternal mortality, etc. the works, you know, I mean, lack of sanitation for two thirds of the population and so on and so forth. So the inequality looks a bit more disgusting than it does here, if you see what I mean. I think both India and China, inequality is still is now the big issue. Where the governments don't like to portray it like that. But the politics is telling us that in India all the time. The political struggle going on right now with Bo Xilai, et cetera, in China is also related to inequality. There's a, there's a model uh, clash 
in China as well. I think we're seeing a churning even in these areas that are seen as the emerging countries where, in fact, capitalism as we know it has a future because it can enter these public spaces, <coughs> but where possibly the social and political <coughs> resistance will prevent it from doing it in quite the same way. Yeah. Will you have any thoughts? Well, look, I, I, have had a, I had a surreal experience this week, actually. I was invited by the Democratic Party of Japan, um, who were the governing party, the landslide victory in uh, um, 2010, um, to, uh, and I, it wasn't even when I got there that I realized actually um, the kind of awesomeness of what they wanted. They, 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 they think the Japanese capitalist model is broken, Democratic Party of Japan, and they, the invitation was, um, could I use the ideas in the state we're in and, in and in them and us, could I take those ideas to help the Democratic Party of Japan refashion what Japan's economic model should look like for its manifesto in the 2013 election? <laughs> I mean... Uh, I got off the plane and I got, went to have dinner with them. Um, uh, and I, it was all completely, I mean, it was completely bamboozled me. Went to have a dinner and there was three cabinet members, you know. And you think, and the, and the first question was, um, what is the uh, view in Britain of the Democratic Party of Japan and what do you think we should be doing? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Raise your hands, those of you who've heard the Democratic Party of Japan. <laughs> There you are. But, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the centre-left governing party in the world's third biggest economy. Ha! Huh. You know, and only three people in the audience have heard of it. I mean, uh, so, I mean, <clears throat> uh, what, is that, what do I conclude from that? I conclude from that that the world is in quest of um, a model of, of um, good capitalism. I mean, when I wrote the statement, I thought the Japanese model looked pretty bloody good to me. Um, but actually, what's happened, they told me, um, is that um, under enormous pressure from America, they've deregulated and privatized it, and it's broken in their hands, and it was a developmental state, and now they have to create an entrepreneurial state that will do open innovation um, and scale it up big time um, in Japan. And I think they will do it. But I mean, and, I, and, and that might end up being prototypical of how to do a better capitalism. I mean, I, I wouldn't write off um, the Nordic model if I were you. I think that what's taking place, uh, and I, I include the Germany in that, I completely share your view about China. And actually, I'm a, I'm, although I'm much more sympathetic to what's going on in India, I think it's good. I mean, actually, you know, we both know, <laughs> precisely, we both, we both know that actually, I mean, the place is profoundly problematic. I, and I actually think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm expecting there to be um, a Chinese spring um, within three to five years. In fact, I think the fact that uh, Wen Jinbao felt compelled um, to um, put Mr. Bo in house arrest um, and say the things he said about the Cultural Revolution is phenomenally important. Um, Wen um, is a uh, in, um, was great follower of Zhao Jiang, who was the General Secretary of the Communist Party, who wanted to do a deal um, with the Tiananmen protesters. There's a photograph of him on, on Xi Jinping's right-hand shoulder after having talked to the protesters. And that's the Prime Minister of China. It's his last year, and he's decided that actually he wants to open the whole bloody thing up and that there's a fork in the road, and actually China can either liberalise all the risks that that's taking, including democratising the place, or it can go the, back to where Mr. Bo was trying to take it. And actually what you saw was a decisive blow to what's up, where I think will lead to a Chinese spring, and that actually will really throw the... Kind of, you know, the Chinese, the, the, the so-called Chinese model that's worked up until now will not look very clever after that. So I come back to, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that capitalism has to have if it's to operate well. One is a social contract. We need to think about what a 21st century social contract should look like. One is responsible ownership, that actually we're owners of, of capital, um, except obligations as well as rights over the assets that they hold high trust workplaces, um, financial systems that actually work to serve productive entrepreneurship, states that are um, accountable and responsible, but actually help entrepreneurs and ordinary citizens alike manage risk. There's a whole cl cl cluster of things that have to happen. They happen best, I think, in Sweden and um, Germany, um, but it's not perfect. Um, and that's the capitalist model that I would like to steer the UK towards.
Gosh, we've got quite a long way from India there, didn't we? <laughs> That's a great tour, Doris. Or do you, do you want to say anything, John, or should we take no, a look? No, only that I don't know much about India. I know a little bit about China. And it is sort of astonishing what they have done in China. I mean, half a billion people raised out of absolute poverty. I mean, you, you could argue there's no economic achievement to parallel that sort of anywhere. Um, but, but the price of it has been, um, you know, they had a very equal society. Now they have a much richer one, but one with really significant levels of inequality. And it comes back to this thing about... In a, you know, inequality is the is um, I always think there's something odd about that expression, the elephant in the room, because um, you know, to, as something you ignore. Because actually, if there were an elephant right here now, <laughs> we'd all be going, "Oh my God, look at the flipping elephant! <laughs> what are we going to do? Ah, <laughs> run away!" And and you know, it, inequality is that second kind of elephant, um, and they have the, they have it present in a very 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 big way in China now. Let's take another one. Uh, oh, look, there's a lady with a microphone. Excellent. <laughs> um, I was just keen to get the panel's thoughts on um, what is the right balance to strike um, between cracking down on the banking sector and private equity, etc., and encouraging strong financial and economic growth and encouraging lending to, say, small businesses in a, in a country. John, you want to go first? Don't you? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I mean, um, I think, you know, a lot of what ba the financial sector is doing... Um, has got to a point where it has no social utility at all. Um, of that $600 trillion um, dollar figure that Will was mentioning, a lot of that is a zero-sum thing where two, two institutions bet against each other. Mm. Um, you know, one wins, one loses. But, but the kind of um, benefit to society uh, is zero. And, and, and banking in the finance sector, at its heart, ought to be a fairly simple business. They take deposits and they lend money and they create credit. And that's absolutely... It's not just you know, quite a nice thing to have. That is central to how the economy functions. Um, and it's something that the whole sector has drifted away from and has become, um, I think, insufficiently focused on seeing as its own raison d'etre. I mean, I think that you, you got that when, you know, the activities that got the banks in trouble weren't lending to small and medium-sized businesses. So there was something I thought really cynical about the fact that when we were talking, when the conversation was about bank regulation and... Vickers report and things like that. The first thing they said is, well, don't blame us if we stop lending to small and medium businesses. Which was actually, I thought, fairly scandalous because that had nothing to do with the issues of, that, got, that got us in the trouble we we're in. And it has nothing to do with the issues that Vickers raises. But it is to do with what the rest of the economy needs. And it's slightly like, you know, um, cradling a puppy and holding a gun against its head and saying, well, you know, don't blame us if the dog dies. <laughs> when you talk about things like, you know, making derivatives less risky. India's banks are, are more tightly regulated, aren't they? Considerably more tightly regulated. Slightly charging. more. There's a lot Slightly of pressure more. to deregulate, as mm. you can imagine, because, yeah. Uh, but I completely agree with Bill. I mean, you know, finance should be boring. Mm. Well, John, sorry. Uh, finance should not be this exciting, sexy thing where people are making lots of money. Finance, to be socially useful, has to be a very, very boring activity. I mean, Keynes recognized this too, because mm -hmm. that's what you should be doing. And the period when finance was deregulated is the period where they lent less and less and less to small businesses, small productive enterprises, the self-employed, and so on and so forth. So it, clearly, the current structure of the way the light touch regulation, etc., is completely misplaced. And you really would have to get back to a much tighter regulation if you want finance to serve the needs of the economy and of society rather than the other way around. So on that, but I, can I abuse the fact that I'm, I'm talking yeah, <laughs> to, to sort of do a kind of will and broaden the issue on this, uh, which is that, you know, I think in a way when we're talking about what, what Will is describing as good capitalism or ideal ideal yeah. capitalism, mm -hmm. is actually socialism, right? I mean, let's look at the system we have at the moment. What do we have? We have a system where the, the notion is that growth and the enhancement of economic well-being has to come from private investment, that that's the stimulus, and that therefore you have to do whatever you can to encourage private profitability in certain activities. And then, of course, the whole question is, where do you do it, the extent to which you do it, how much do you regulate them, and so on and so forth. Supposing we step back once and think, okay, what do we really want for well-being? And you don't then necessarily want the same things. You don't necessarily think that there has to be an increase in profitability 
for everything. You don't necessarily think there has to be an increase in GDP for everything. You certainly don't necessarily think there has to be an increase in productivity. A lot of service sectors, it's much worse if there's more productivity. I mean, I'm more productive if I'm teaching 200 students in a class instead of 10. But I don't want that productivity. You know, we don't want fewer waiters and fewer nurses per person that they are serving. So we need to actually abandon those notions and look at the nature of economic well-being, material well-being as well, and say, well, what are the things we need to get there? What are the kinds of incentives that we provide? I think the problem that we've had in the last 20 years is we completely distorted the incentives. So it's not that there are bankers being bad people and evil and greedy and all of that kind of thing. It's that the incentives in the system <coughs> force you to behave in ways that are inimical to social well-being. So we have to step back and ask ourselves, what do we need for this better society? And then I think the kinds of things Will was, say, was saying, well, in a sense, that's socialism too, really. So you know, forget the ism at this point. I think what we need to do is think of the society we want, what are the economic laws and the kinds of incentives we provide that encourage that society. Yeah. Well, do you, do, you, do you want to just be? Do you want to say anything we'll work very briefly? I think we should try and get as many more questions in as we can, because we're, we're... I think Maggie should be boring. <laughs> it's the Captain, Man Captain this... Mannering model. Yeah. Captain Mannering. <laughs> oh, there's one right in the middle at the front here. Should we do that next? And then, there we go. Lady, oh, sorry. You, you seem quite optimistic about Occupy. It seems to me that Occupy will get nowhere without some sort of power boost. Now, one possibility, I suppose, might be the rise of charismatic leaders like the 1930s, God forbid. Another possibility might be the backing of some political party, Socialist Workers' Party. So my question is, what is the future of Occupy without some power behind it? Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, I mean, very briefly, I, I'm not so sure about the future of Occupy, but I think the, um, the future of that particular idea uh, about society being um, a very wide, widespread feeling that the rules are in effect, in effect rigged. I think there's tremendous future in Occupy's ideas. I think that the movement itself, I, I don't... I, Frankly, don't know. I think the um, I think this uh, look. I'm I'm a great believer um, in the power of ideas. Rather, than the, I mean, I think you charismatic leaders are fine, but charismatic words have got to leave their mouths, which makes sense. Um, and those words are driven by uh, um, sets of ideas, which actually usually put there by, as Keynes says, some long dead philosopher. You know, and I, you know, oh, I'm very interested by your. You know, I'm, I've championed this notion of good capitalism. Um, I think it is slightly different. Well, it is different. I mean, I, your de depiction of it as de facto socialism really interests me. <laughs> I thought, bloody hell, I've been rumbled. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, it is, it, I think it is different from socialism in this respect. Um, although I suppose um, you could flip it around and say this would be good socialism. I mean, the, 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 gr the great thing about my definition of good capitalism is it's plural. I mean, it would have, you know, there's lots of decision-making centres uh, in, the, in, the, in the capitalist structures that I'm in favour of, you know, whereas, you, I mean, the point about socialism is that if you have central planning and, you know, and common ownership, you don't get pluralism. On the other hand, I mean, the best socialist thinkers always said that a good socialism had embedded in it plural decision-making, so, you know, uh, and the two kind of meet. So, I mean, I... Uh, uh, but it's, it's only when you get, you know, ideas like that that, or I, mean, I thought, I thought, I think Occupy were kind of searching for that because Occupy were, you know, saying, look, you know, you mustn't see us as people who are, you know, for communism or for socialism. I mean, there were some libertarians in the in the Occupy movement. They were just asking tough questions about whether the way the system had operated and had broken down. That's how the, that's what they that was their self-avowed kind of explanation for themselves. Um, it'll only be when actually it starts to crystallise into a program of action with a philosophy behind it that actually will start to cohere. Um, and it's perfectly possible for one of the existing political parties to do that. I mean, um, it would be possible um, for the British Labour Party to um, become a champion of these ideas. I mean, I think that's what you know, Ed Miliband has been trying to do, actually, um, with his speech at the party conference last September, late September, early October. That's what he was doing. Um, he hasn't persuaded his shadow cabinet to come with him. Um, I find it distressing that, you know, um, uh, Ed Balls is a good thing, um, but nonetheless he will, he, he, will he will brief and say, you know, um, 
I'm the pro-business chancellor, you know, and I'm resisting these dark forces that are arguing for good capitalism and responsible capitalism and describing your business as predatory. That's not me. I, you know, I mean, actually, the, the shadow cabinet seems to me have to cohere around um, a common position, um, and, you, and they might actually get somewhere. Um, so it's not impossible that actually this, this that Occupy's role could be to trigger things elsewhere in the political spectrum that does the business rather than do it itself. Okay, can you take a... Oh, look at that. The keen lady in the front. I'm glad. OK. Um, I've got quite a few hairs, hairs running in my brain, but one of the questions that I've got to uh, want to raise is whether the question is what is the future of capitalism or, you know, what are the alternatives now? I mean, you referred to um, a, a Socialist Workers' Party slogan earlier on about uh, state capitalism. The other famous one was one solution revolution. Well, I don't think... Many of us believe that now, mm. but you know, hopefully there isn't a future for capitalism, and there's a future for something else. But we don't know what that is yet in the in the one act in the, in Act One. Um, but one of the things that's been really missing, but there's been a few things that's been really missing from this discussion inevitably. But one one of those is the question of. Um, the green issues that face the planet, which hasn't been there, we haven't been there at all, and what that means in terms of what we need to do around productivity, which you raised, and actually productivity, not necessarily, increasing productivity not necessarily being a good thing, not only in the service industries of, you know, people like you and me who are university professors teaching 200 students, but in terms of what we use in order to make so that's one issue that's been missing. Another issue that's been missing has been um, what the damage has been done by neoliberalism in this country, particularly Blair Blairite neoliberalism, which hasn't just been about the state being involved in capitalism, which as you have all said has always been the case, but of the state deliberately moving into support and create and um, promote particular versions of capitalism. And uh, moving away from that is proving very difficult. And then I just want to do one more thing, <laughs> which is to, it's not a question, but is to teach everybody here how to say the word apartheid. Because <laughs> as an ex-South African, it really, really irritates me when people say apartheid. You only have to remember it's keeping people apart and it's hate. Apart hate, and that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> Jaiji, do you want to... <laughs> We've all learned something. Um, Jaiji, do you want to go take that one? Yeah, well, yes, I, I agree with you, absolutely. You know, the trouble is that in the English language, we've used up the, these words, like capitalism, socialism now. You know, you say socialism, and people think the Soviet state and so on. So we've used them up, unfortunately. What we clearly need is a different way of looking at the economic system. And I do think there are some fascinating experiments going on in the world. If you look at Bolivia and Ecuador, for example, there are, those constitutions are explicitly recognizing the rights of nature, the rights of people as being above a whole bunch of other things, recognizing the role of private enterprise, but seeing it as very much subservient to a broader economic system. So, and you know, they call it different things, but I think we are really, maybe just, we have to invent some new word. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's one of the, the tasks of coalescing these ideas because I think there are already existing new forms of thinking about how to deal with the relationship between society and economy. And we have to just break out of the mold of saying, well, you know, if we do this, it's capitalism. If we do that, it's socialism. Let's think of these ways which necessarily involve regulating capital, of course, but they involve a bunch of other things, including creating incentives to respect nature, to respect the ability, you know, diversity, to give accountability to public institutions, that kind of thing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have thoughts, John? I mean, I think the, the most... I, I completely agree with Jati, and the, the most... The threat that the existing system, whichever is ism you attach to it, the most serious threat by far uh, is the one of the e ecology and resources and the climate. And, you know, that's the... Um, a model based on growth is running into this very simple and clear and unmistakable, um, you know, light at the end of, tun of the tunnel, which is actually a train coming the other way. Um, you know, the average American uses 100 gallons of water per person per day. 
there isn't enough fresh water on the planet for everyone to live like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it is clear that some other model is going to have to evolve because, uh, or maybe you know, property, private property-based, market-based mechanisms are magically <laughs> going to fix this. But, but you, I think you have to be quite far gone in wishful thinking to, to think that. I just on the green thing, I mean, I, the Stern, um, Nick Stern, professor of uh, economics at uh, the LSE, who did a big, big report on this, of course. I mean, what Nick Stern said, and I think it's worthwhile remembering, and I, I actually think it's, a, I think it's a slightly better pitch than um, is this, is that actually um, we can take the actions that will actually um, lower carbon dioxide emissions to ensure that temperatures go no higher than two degrees centigrade over the next uh, kind of the rest of the century. And by, but actually all it means in terms of lost growth is that we'll get to where GDP would have been two years later. So GDP in 2052 will be where it would have been in 2050 if we hadn't done it, but actually we would have taken the measures to have lowered carbon dioxide emissions. And you know, that, it doesn't, you know, you uh, and don't uh, underestimate the extraordinary power of new technologies um, to you know, be much more economical about the use of water or the use of um, fuel or whatever it is. So I actually don't take the view um, that actually it means that we have to have a transformation in our lifestyles. Well I, I, well, I take the view that actually we should take it bloody seriously because it really matters, but actually, you know, the world, can it doesn't mean, you know, that everyone's condemned to kind of minimum living standards forever. Um, we can, I mean, and I think if you, if you believe Nick Stern, which I do, you know, um, it's growth constraining, but it doesn't mean the end of growth. But I think we should take, and I, just to finish off this point, I mean, look, and I made this point to Vince Cable, and it's worthwhile making. I mean, um, the, uh, the Japanese in the way to Fukushima have closed down 54 nuclear power plants, which provided a third of their electricity. And no local community in uh, Japan is going to commit the, is going to commit the reopening of this nuclear, these nuclear power plants unless they have explicit understandings that they conform to international safety regulations, that there is complete open accountability to the um, community in which these um, plants are sited, and actually there are rigorous um, processes um, you know, for the management of waste in case, and, and what's going to happen in the case of disasters like the tsunami. And actually, you know, um, which means that the third biggest economy in the world is now in the market buying oil and gas. Um, Germany has done the same thing, it's the fourth biggest economy in the world, as well, oil prices are just going through the roof. Uh, you know, because there's not much oil about. Um, so, you know, the, 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 this is not a kind of stuff, I mean, this is, you know, has been confined to the green movement, but actually it's so bloody real. You know, having secure and stable and resilient and diverse sources of power so the lights go on um, and you can get from A to B um, is becoming a huge issue globally. And so the green agenda is no longer marginal or at the margins, it's absolutely centre stage. You will, and um, I've been, oh, excellent. I'm being waved at from over there, so I know, I, I do apologise, I know there were lots of other people with questions they'd like to ask, but I think we've had a really interesting, stimulating discussion, and I hope you've all enjoyed it <coughs> as much as I certainly have. Um, I, and I'd be grateful if you could thank our excellent panel of Will Hutton, Jaiti Ghosh, and John Lanchester in this additional way. Thank you.